with All Saints, we I took every opportunity there was. I used to get people go, why are you dressing that band? They're just some little indie band that never, why are you in, wasting your time? Well, one of these bands that, that I've wasted my time on was the Kings of Leon, and they ended up being like the next greatest band in the world. We opened, and immediately we were doing like, Ten thousand pound a week, or whatever, and, and no one else was doing anything like that. There were people fighting to go on the stand, people like cry, climbing over each other to give me their business card. All the best stores in the world queuing up to 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 buy the first collection. Why did you decide to sell? He put a gun to my head and and made me an offer. Literally, I couldn't refuse. Quick question, when did you discover that you're a leader, that your actions matter to those that look up to you? You may be an entrepreneur or an aspiring entrepreneur, innovating to change the world, or a CEO navigating a crisis, or a parent returning to work and learning to lead your career, your team, your children. There are many faces of leadership, and this is the podcast to explore them all. Welcome to Anatomy of a Leader with me, Maria Vorostovsky. I'm a headhunter and founder of HVO Search, where I help ambitious leaders hire their executive teams. My job today on this show is to help you discover your superpowers, to help you avoid making some of the same mistakes, and to remind you that even if you do, perfection doesn't and shouldn't exist. Thank you so much for listening and please do subscribe and follow this podcast because it really helps others to discover these incredible stories. This show will challenge the way you think and may even change your life. Stuart, welcome to Anatomy of a Leader. Hi. Nice to have you here. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Founder and creative director of All Saints. And I'd really love to talk about your journey. But before we get into that, I'm just curious, what got you into fashion in the first place? Um, There's quite an interesting story. Um, I, uh, I had, so I, I went to um, an all boys school in uh, South London. Uh, it was a, you know, state school, grammar school. Um, and uh, from a very young age, from about the age of five, the first time that I heard um, David Bowie on on my auntie's radio in Dundee in Scotland, um, kind of, I remember, you know, walking across and, and sitting down next to this big old teak uh, music centre, seventies type thing, and um, and listening to the words from Starman and 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 I just thinking how really creative and inspiring and and interesting it was, and it was otherworldly, and then looking at him and 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 following him and I, the, the first album i bought was was um was a bowie album um and then kate bush came out and and then i saw a woman who was really creative and so i was really into um fashion from a very young age but we didn't really have any money in dundee then my mother married my stepfather uh when i was 11 and we moved to london and i ended up in this all boys school some manner grammar school for boys um and I used to have to wear a uniform um, as quite strict, but I would customize the uniform. Um, I remember going to Selfridges when, when I was about 12 or 13 and, and getting a sweatshirt. And um, we had a kind of joke with another kid at school. And he used to call himself the Royal Moi, like as a sort of, um, it was kind of a funny sort of moniker for, you know, thinking that he was, you know, something other than everybody else or whatever. And I had a sweatshirt made with the Royal Wall written on the back and I gave one to him and one to me and I, and I wore it to school under my blazer. And I used to be made to sit at the front of the class and um, and I had this sweatshirt on under my blazer with the tie and all that. And they didn't really spot it because normally you have to wear a you know, V-neck sweater, but they didn't spot it. And I, I they made me sit at the front because I was obviously um, talked too much and... Um, disturbing other kids or whatever. So I, I was made to sit there and I, and I took my blazer off and it forgot it had the royal what written on the back of it and everybody burst out laughing. And the teacher was like, you know, what's going on? Well, you know, and, and so, and it, it was kind of funny. And, and, and then I started doing things like, you know, you, you had the traditional school uniform where I would go and buy some really cool, try like a pair of Faro trousers or a pair of waffle sort of pegs or whatever, you know, just always 
did styled it differently than than the rest of the kids. Because I know I don't know why I never wanted to wear the traditional school uniform. Um, and back in those days, you could get away with it because fashion wasn't like it is now. Like you know, with kids, um, you know, my kids go to school and they're always getting told off about that uniform and all that because people are aware of it. But they weren't back in those days, and so I could get away with it. Um, and then I did. For some reason, I did really well at school because um, I never used to do any homework. Um, I used to just, I think I must have just picked it all up in the lessons. And uh, I used to actually pay somebody to, you know, um, like pennies or whatever, to copy their homework and, and you know, in the morning of the way to school, like, you know, um, and, and, and it. But then, then I came out with all these, you know, I got like an A in maths and an, and, and, and an A in physics and an A in, um, obviously, I was very, very, good at art and design and all that sort of stuff. But I was amazed that I got, you know, phys- I did so well at maths and physics. I was like, hell, I must be good at this. So uh, I, I went to college and I thought, well, what am I going to do? Because they, they don't teach you really back in those days. I had no idea that you could do fashion as a career. No, no, no one told you that. I, I, and there, there weren't all the shops that there are now. There wasn't even, you know, there wasn't really top shop or H&M didn't exist and Zara didn't exist, but designers didn't, you know, never heard about anything like that. Um, So I ended up um, going to a technical college um, to do A-levels in arts, maths and physics and um, at an art foundation. And the day that I was going to go to school, I'd I'd left home, got to live with my sister. She'd bleached my hair blonde like David Sylvian from Japan. Um, And I woke up in the morning, that, that was when I first finished school and went to stay with her for about two, three months over the summer. And by the time that I, the morning I was going to college, I, my roots were really long and I was like, oh, you know, terrible or whatever. So I, and I, I'd mixed this burgundy crazy color off my sister, who's a hairdresser. And I thought, well, I dye my hair burgundy. So I dyed it at about six in the morning. By seven, eight o'clock, I realized that my hair wasn't burgundy. It was fuchsia. I drive pink. What am I going to do? Um, and I had to hitchhike to get to college. And, and anyway, I hitchhiked. My car was pulled over like almost a handbrake turned. And I was like, I thought I was going to take about a half an hour to get a ride. They, two cars pulled up once and then one of them got out when I got in the other and started arguing, saying, get in my car, you know, all right. I was like, God, I can't believe that, you know, somebody would pick, you know, stop so quickly. Because I, you know, I was mortified that I had this new bright, I didn't have a hat either or, you know, had to go to college and I, and I was wearing like a little cropped, well, a little short leather biker jacket and I had a boiler suit on with studded belt and some biker boots and turned up at Art Foundation. And of course, you know, I was fine with that. But then I realized I had to go to maths and art, uh, sorry, physics. And, and I kind of so self-conscious. I'm like 15, 16 years old at the time thinking like, Jesus Christ, this is so embarrassing or whatever. Um, and then we went for lunch. And the next minute, some kids come over, looks like Robert Smith from The Cure's like, Hello, oh, mate, how you doing? Can I sit with you? Uh, you know, so what band are you in? And I'm like, uh, I'm not in a band. And he's like, you must be in a band. Like, oh, some girl comes over looking like um, the, the lead singer from the Thompson Twins with like shaved at the sides of it. So she's like, what band are you in? And I'm like, I'm not in a band. And then um, some other kid come over, looks like um, the guy from Big Country with a checked shirt with those sleeves. And she's like, what band are you in? He's all hair up like that. And, I, and I, I was laughing, going, I'm not in a... So the girl said, well, you must be on the fashion course. And I'm like, what fashion course? And and so she said to me, um, I caught you. you. You look like... You, you look amazing. Like, let me take you to... It. So we, we walked up the corridor. I remember, kind of, must have been really funny. Think about, you know, Robert Smith and, and the Thompson Twins and Big Country and me walking up, look, looking like cross between... David Sylvia and Mick Khan from Japan walking through the corridor. I walk into this room and there's pan cutting tables and sewing machines and there's like 30 girls and two guys. Uh, and, and I'm like, oh, wow, this is where I want to be. Uh, you know, because I'd done the maths and the physics and it was, I realized I was so out of my depth. I don't know how I got those O levels. There's no way on earth I could do A level maths or I wasn't interested in it in the slightest. So I realized I'd made a mistake. So I went up to the teacher and said, I'm, I've made a huge mistake. I, I need to be on this course. And um, she said, I'm sorry, you know, you're, it's started now. You, you, you'll have to apply for next year. Like that. And I went, 
no, honestly, listen, I've made a huge mistake. I've, I've, you know, came here today for the first day. I'm doing massive physics. I, I, I'm, I'm going to drop out. I don't want to do that. I hate it. I, I just know that it's a waste of time. Um, I'm born to do this. And she's like laughed at me and said, what do you mean by that? And I went, well, I kind of, I've been customizing my clothes all my life since, you know, I was little. And she went, can you sew like that? I went, uh, yeah. And she's like, really? And I went, yeah, my mum used to sew a lot and had taught me how to, and I used to custom, I used to buy vintage things and, you know, take buy huge pairs of trousers and make them fit me. And I'd made this boiler suit, it was massive, and I'd made it, you know. So she gave me a bit of fabric in a pocket. She said, go, you know, if you can make that by the end of the day, then I'll let you, I'll think about it. And I made it in like 10 minutes and I brought the pocket back. She went, my God, you're miles ahead of everyone else. You can start tomorrow. <laughs> so that is how I got into fashion that way. Um, I, I, it, but that was, you know, obviously very early days as a young kid. And then I started to learn about designers and um you, you, you know, introduced to that world, and I ended up um, doing really well at it. Obviously, uh, I did a, a tailoring course in the evening with a Royal Huntsman tailor. Learned how to do, you know, basting and uh, and all. I mean, I was so engrossed with it, and and started making all my own clothes. and And then I was, uh, you know, they advised me that you know you should go off and do a degree in this. You're you're really good at it. And um, so I was going to apply to St Martin's, but I was too. There was all this talk about how 300 people apply and only 30 get in and all this. I was just kind of nervous about um, not getting in and, and getting, you know, what was I going to do then sort of thing. I didn't want to go back to this, you know, what had happened at the beginning of that college where I'd gone on the wrong course and, and, and they told me you've got to wait a year and all that. And I just wanted to get on with life, you know. So I applied to Nottingham because also I I'd, I'd looked at, you know, the British designers and there was Vivian Westwood to me was a bit, at that time, I was kind of a, was a bit, very over the top. Paul Smith was very boring in state, but he was menswear and I kind of was interested in menswear. So I thought, if I go to Nottingham, train, and I might have a chance of meeting him. And, and I did. Uh, so, you know, I got into Nottingham and did, I think in the second year, won virtually every competition that I entered, like Smirnoff, Fashion Awards, um, I won Menswear Day Awards. It was televised, it was at filmed, it was at the Royal Albert Hall, uh, and it was put out on Thames Television. And um, I, I'd won a Paul Smith Mont Gok Blanc competition, um, and uh, Paul Smith loved what I what I did. And I, I'd taken suit jackets and I turned them inside out, and and then put the seams and and all that. And he he absolutely loved it and wanted to put it in his new collection, Paul Smith. So. Um, he offered me uh, an internship. Um, but after I won the Smirnoff, um, David Reese from Reese, R E I S S, yeah, the clothing brand, he phoned the university about 15 times. Um, and I kept getting messages going, can you call this guy back and all that. But I, I, I'd actually met him because he had a shop in Nottingham. And, and, and back in those days, Reese was like a multi brand retailer, used to buy from Italian brands and all that and I'm like I, yeah, I didn't really want to work with him I wanted to work with Paul Smith Paul Smith that was the reason I'd gone to Nottingham so the dean of faculty the head of the university uh, art department told me that uh, you know you you need to call this guy back and we want you to go and see him I'm not interested in he, he's like you need to do it for the university you can't just ignore people you know, that's you know that was the advice it was good advice actually yeah. because in you know in the end you know i always try and speak to everybody i don't, never ignore people but back in those i was kind of like what's the point but anyway i went down to london uh went to the king's road i met david reese i went they had a shop in the king's road i've never seen a shop like it it's like there was a thousand people in it you know 50 of them queued up to buy you know suits and leather jackets I mean like you've never seen it, it was, they, they don't exist shops like that don't exist anymore it's kind of like you know that that Primark on the first day of Black Friday <laughs> that was what Reese was like in the late 80s in the King's Road I think shopping was different then there weren't that many um, retailers there weren't there wasn't Primark there wasn't H&M it wasn't Zara that I was saying so um, and I was kind of shocked thinking wow you know this is actually it's actually quite a big deal this guy is quite you know, he's successful, obviously, and he's driving me insane. All 
you know, he's got the he's he's reign over and over and over again. He hasn't given up. Um, that was another thing in life that you know, um, that kind of taught me that you know determination and uh, you know don't just give up. Just you know keep going until you get what you want or whatever. Or hopefully. And so I went upstairs and I showed him. I got the suit out. And he was like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah I don't need to see that. I've seen it. I want you like that." It was kind of. He just handed me an envelope, and I was like, "What's this?" And he goes, "Open it. Open it." So I opened it, and it's five hundred quid in cash and a ticket to Pisa. Um, and I'm like, you know, right in Italy. Oh, what's this? And and he went. Well, you, so next week he goes, "I'm going to Pitiworo in Italy. It's the world's number one menswear fair, and uh, I want you to come with me." He goes, and that's all. I've given you 500 quid for the week. He goes, and uh, you can keep that, and uh, that's yours. He goes, I'll buy all the tickets, and we'll be staying in the best hotels in the world and eating in the best restaurants in the world, and, and I'll take you to the best shops in the world, and, and we'll go shopping, and we'll go to this men's welfare. It's the best men's welfare in the world, and then we'll go to the best fabric mills in the world, and, and, and you can come with me, and we'll, we'll look at their collections, and we'll buy some fabric, and we'll then we'll go to some of my factories, and you'll design stuff, and we'll put it into work, and it'll be in the shop downstairs in couple of months and you know it'll be great and i just looked at him and i went well, the thing is like I, 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 i've been offered this internship with paul smith and and uh and i'll oh, forget him forget him he's like you know i didn't realize at the time but there was a big sort of rivalry between reese and paul smith or whatever um and um he went you know, you don't even have to tell him like, just come with me, and if you don't like it, after a week, you can walk away and you can go work with Paul Smith. He said, but I think you'll like it. So um, I went, uh, sorry, in the end, I agreed that I would come on this trip. And then a week later, I um, got on the plane to, I went to stay with him at his house, lovely big house in Stanmore. We went to Heathrow, we got on the plane, I was in business class, I was like, what is this, all right. And um so he said to me, right, so what's what's the big what's the big look for next winter? And I and I sat there like that and I thought, God, they don't teach you anything like this. You need to go off um, bad things like that. Um but we used to have like an outside tutor that came in and he used to wear uh, see back in those days there was no such thing as a hoodie, you know, like no one there, there weren't shops, no one wore a hoodie, he didn't read, but it was he this guy had a little Levi's one from uh they bought in america and he used to wear it like it was a sweatshirt hoodie like the, with the large pocket and they used to wear a mac over it and he used to have trousers little zips in the in the in the side of the bottom of them and he used to have like monkey boots like you know um it's quite a unique look um and and he'd, he'd wear like a baseball cap but sort of turned sideways and and so i just described this to david reese saying that that was the look for takes winner <laughs> the big clue and uh, so we landed and got a taxi to Florence um, and he went upstairs, David Reese went upstairs to his hotel room and I was in the courtyard downstairs and I thought, oh, well, at least I've got a trip to Italy, haven't I? <laughs> I was thinking that you know, he's going to find me out. I've got a clue what I'm talking about. Um, and then we went around the shops and Dries uh, van Noon and, 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 and the Antwerp Six and, and you know, and Easter and Big and Bows, they'd all launched these new collections and they were in the shops in Florence. And it was all little cardigans with zips and hoods and little mats and trousers with zips in them and monkey boots. And he, he was like, what? Well, you know. And he bought loads of samples. We went back to the hotel. He went upstairs and we went into his room. You could see he was kind of excited. And I was thinking, well, it's right out, right? This. And then he, he got on the phone and he, he called downstairs. He ordered a bottle of champagne and, and they brought that up, room service. And he rang his general manager, the area manager of the stores, he had about 15 stores at the time. And he was really goes, this boy's a genius. I can't believe it. He's predicted everything. Oh, I can't believe it. He's unbelievable, this boy, you know. And um, and then we went to the fabric mills and we went to the show. And we went, and it was really great fun. And in the end, actually, he bought me a red double-breasted Gaultier uh, pour Gibo, which was the, the, the coolest tailoring collection in the world it was kind of things like you know all pop stars and and tv presenters who were cool at that time like jonathan ross had one and abc were wearing it and gaultier was like a god to me at that time and, and, and anyone who was in menswear um and he bought me this skin tight red double-breasted jacket with a slightly larger shoulder and it had the lining was like with skeletons on it and in, in red and black and it was like, a, I think it was about 700 quid, but it was in lira back in those times. It was seven, 700 pounds, like, 
It's like somebody buying, I mean, I was about 20, 18, 19, 20 or whatever. That's like somebody buying someone a £20,000 Garmin or £10,000. It's like the equivalent. And he said, do you really like it? I was trying it on in this Louisa Via Roma in Florence. And uh, I was just like, you know, this, this would be like a dream if I owned this. And he went, I'll buy it for you if you come and work for me. He goes, and you tell that Paul Smith to fuck off. And I went, uh, all right. <laughs> I mean, bought me the jacket and I went away. So that's how I ended up in fashion. Yeah. What a story. Yeah. I mean, that must have been like the biggest validation for your instinct for somebody who is already so successful to say not only that they want you, but to take so much um, determination to kind of get to you, like throw you in the deep end and... Yeah, and um, well, and and yeah, I mean, I, I was just a kid, and um, and I ended up, I was still in the second year, uh, and I ended up working for David um, every Friday and Saturday. I'd get get, get up at five thirty on a Friday, get the six o'clock train. Sometimes I'd be sat next to Paul Smith on the train, and I never really ever told him where I was going. But I did. I told him that I couldn't do this. I actually went back and asked Paul Smith about this internship and whether he would pay me, and he actually said. No, we don't pay interns. Mm -hmm. And I went, well, how am I going to survive over the summer? If you, you know, you, you, I mean, you must be able to pay me like fifty quid a week or something. And he went, no. I went, well, I said, but, like, I said, but you know these suits that you want to buy? Yeah, I love them. He goes, I want to put them. In. I'm going to do a whole range based around your collection. Uh, so I'm doing David Reese accent now. <laughs> I'm going to do a whole range based around. Anyway, I was like, yeah, but you're not going to pay me a penny. No. I went, why? And he went, I oh, don't, we don't, we, we haven't got any money. I went, I've just read that you've got a £10 million deal in Japan. That's not me. I'm not got, I, you know, I've got, I've got 10 million quid. I'm like, but he said, and, and, and the company, they wouldn't allow it. I went, who owns the company? Well, well, I do. I'm like, well, so you can, I mean, 50 quid a week, you can't even pay me that. No, I went, okay, well, listen, sorry, but I can't do that. So I, I turned Paul Smith that. Couldn't believe that I did it. It wasn't just for the money. It was because and it wasn't just for that red Coltier jacket. Mm -hmm. It was, um, I had such a great, I mean, it really, he, uh, yeah, you're right. David Reese, he just gave me, he believed in me, like, and just gave me, I mean, it was, only, when I think about it now, he must have been insane giving this 18, 90 year old kid completely free reign to, to buy whatever he wanted fabrics wise design whatever I wanted and put it into the shops and I mean he used to I mean we we did it in we used to buy in the beginning he used to argue with me going oh who's going to wear that and all that and and but he would let me do it and it would go in the shop but it'd sell out in one day so then he would order a hundred of them and then it would sell out in two days or the minute they arrived so then we'd order 500 and, 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 and then he ended up letting me just do whatever I wanted and it was kind of like it was I mean, an unbelievable opportunity. So, yeah, I used to go there every Friday and Saturday um, whilst I went through, and, and I worked all over the summer, and and he was very generous. He even paid for me to go off to Ibiza for, on holiday for a week with a friend nice. of mine. Uh, <laughs> but I couldn't believe, because I, I I was reticent about taking a holiday because I thought I'm, I'm not going to get paid if, I'm, if I go away, and I needed the money. Um, and he said, oh, I'll still pay you, even if go go and have a holiday really you know and and it, it was a very generous go well, of course i was I didn't realize it at the time but you know in his, in his eyes i was like a golden goose laying a golden egg every day like designing stuff that was flying out and he you know he loved it and then, you know they, they sponsored me to do my degree show and and i finished my degree david was happy with that and he could have tried to persuade me to leave i mean he kind of did at one point but i just said i think i should finish my degree so I did that and I went to work with him and so when I joined him it was a like a multi-brand retail store so I then created Reese's image of what that is as a standalone brand and he already had this kind of like the suit and tie thing sort of sewed up himself because he that but that he didn't have any of the other side of it the fashion side of it uh, he had no clue about that so he kind of left all of that to me so I was then allowed to design knitwear, shirts, socks, shoes, ties. I used to go in there and buy the ties because that was something that um, Reese would buy from other designers where the, it sounds ridiculous, but I would go in and I'd buy 500 of this tie and 500 of that tie. 
I thought that's what everybody was doing. He, he recently said everybody else used to buy five, and this kid, me, used to come in and buy five under that and five under two under that. And everything. And it's kind of funny now when I think about it, but that's how many ties we used to sell. They used to, I mean, they had a shop at the King's Road used to do £100,000 on a Saturday, and, you know, this was 25 years ago, so that's the equivalent of doing, I don't know, 400 grand in a day or something. That's unbelievable. What's the biggest lesson that you received during your time there? Uh, I think he kind of allowed me to do anything, but he also, he had this drive and determination to succeed. And if something didn't go right, wouldn't deter him from getting to the goal. You just, you know, overcome every obstacle and make sure that you get to the goal. Um, And the goal was, um, you know, having the right product at the right price and working with a factory. And even if they were late, then maybe negotiate with them and get a discount. He didn't really teach me what to do. He just kind of allowed me, but he, the, the worst kind of budget restraints that we worked out, we could only buy so much of this and that and all that. But fortunately at that time, we, everything, everything seemed to sell. No, it's not the same. Where do you think it, everything was selling at that time? I think there wasn't, there wasn't the competition that there is now. There was, there, you know, as I'm saying, there wasn't, um, there wasn't anything like, there wasn't online shopping, of course. There wasn't, uh, there wasn't anything like Primark. There wasn't anything like Zara. There was, H&M had opened a few shops, but to be honest, it was just complete junk. It was really badly made, really cheap and nasty, and, and no one that had any sort of taste would buy anything from H&M back in those days. You look at it now, I mean, obviously... They've all had to up their game. When I was at school, I didn't know you could do fashion for a career. There was magazines that came out like The Face and ID, and and then there was Arena, and then there was, you know, other magazines. Everybody's become, everybody became interested in fashion, and everyone re- realized you could do that for a living. And loads of kids went to university and learned how to be a designer. And then they looked at companies like, you know, back in those days, H&M obviously used to come and buy stuff from Reese, and so did the people from Gap and whatever, and they would copy it and, and do a cheaper version. But there wasn't the same amount of competition as there is now. After about eight years, um, and I'd started making things in Hong Kong with um, for Reese, um, one of the factory's owners uh, uh, approached me and said, uh, you know, basically, I'd like to, I'd like you to become our agent. Um, we're, we're doing about 10 million turnover. I'll give you 10%. I was like, well, wow, uh, that's a lot of money. Um, are you sure? And he's like, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, if you've got that much money, I've, I've actually got a little business plan for a brand of my own. And I showed him this and I'd kind of worked out, I, I'd been selling uh, Reese back in those days, um, wholesale to some of the best independents in the country and Selfridges, Harvey Nichols, um, Asprey's, a bit like that. And I'd asked the buyers about, you know, I'd had a list of names and my, my initials are ST, um, Stuart Trevor, um, like Simon Templer, the same, uh, it was a character that Roger Moore played, um, a TV show called The Same, uh, before he became James Bond. And he had a really beautiful car that looked like the, um, the Aston Martin DB5 that James Bond, uh, drove, um, in Casino Royale. And this car was a Volvo P1800. It's like, it looked like a cross between that and a car and gear. It was made by Volvo and it was affordable. And I bought one. It was my first ever car. Uh, I bought it in Arizona and shipped it to London. Um, and I used to drive that around everywhere. And, and, and people knew about the Saint and they used to go, oh, here comes the Saint and all this sort of stuff. So I had the idea of this brand that it was going to be, you know, and I'd li- written down the Saint, Saint. And then, and then I was on All Saints Road on Carnival one year and, you know, a bit pissed and, I wake up and I just saw All Saints, right? And I thought, somebody asked me, where's your jacket from? And you go, uh, The Saint or Saint or All Saints just rolls mm-hmm. on the tongue. So I thought, All Saints. And I showed that to these buyers. They all thought that was great. This Hong Kong-based Chinese factory loved it and um, decided to fund uh, me to launch this, our own my, my own brand. And, um, and that's how... All Saints came into being. When you were coming up with the concept, did something spark it? Like something wasn't, you were not seeing in the industry or like where did the idea come about? Well, I'd, I'd 
So when I joined David, I didn't realise in the beginning, you know, no wonder he was, you know, so determined to get hold of me. And, and he was going through a difficult period because there was a late 80s, there was a recession. He'd bought a load of shops uh, that had gone bust and I'd ended up with two shops in the King's Road and two shops in Covent Garden, you know, and, and he was in financial difficulties. And um, so when I came along... Um, and I saw that he was buying, majority of what he was buying was from other designers. And um, some of it was, he, he was buying from, you know, factories in Italy and, and, and putting Reese label. Just, he used to pull out a load of labels from his bag and hand it to the factory and put some Reese labels in. But he never really, so when I came along, I started producing everything under our own label, direct from manufacturer to retail. The margin was huge. So we would be buying things for, five pounds and selling them for a hundred. Um, so, you know, the margins were huge. And, and I looked, I looked at all that and, and basically saved that business. Uh, and then I, uh, launched, uh, it as a wholesale brand and we sold it to Barney's New York, um, Bergdorf Goodman, um, Dane Hudson, Marshall Fields, uh, Fred Siegel in LA, all the best independent stores. And then in Japan, we were selling to, you know, Cebu and um, all, all the big, I mean, basically Harvey Nichols, Selfridges, all the big department stores, and then loads of independent retailers. And David couldn't believe it because when I told him in the beginning that I wanted to do Reese as a wholesale brand, he said to me, he goes, oh, don't be stupid. He goes, you, you can't, we can't do that. I'm like, why? He said, but I said, there's everyone else is doing it. We used to go to the show and he, and he was like, yeah, but they're real designers. And I looked to him, I said, what the fuck am I? I'm a real designer, you know? Let me do it. So he let me do it. And of course, I got it into all of the best retailers in the world. And then I looked, added it all up and, and realized, broke them all down. And I thought, if I launch my own thing and I do half of what I've done at Reese, because, you know, it's a new brand, they, they, maybe they, I mean, we were doing a quarter of a million pounds a season with Barney's New York. They, they loved it. Um, and Selfridges were doing like 100,000 about a season. So I thought if I can do 50 grand with Selfridges and 100 grand with Barney's or even 50 grand or whatever, you add it all up, it comes to, you know, half a million pounds or whatever. So I showed this business plan to, uh, it was kind of funny because, you know, we didn't have computers back in those days. So everything was done like on a ledger. And so I would made this business plan and it was basically based on, this is what I've done for Reese. I could do it myself if I had the right funding. And I, I went to the bank with it and, and the bank just said, not going to give you any money. And then this manufacturer was said, yeah, all right, I'll do it. And and we did it. And we launched the first collection and we wrote over one and a half million uh, in the first season. Um, and it was, I mean, it was, un I mean, we launched it at a show called Sem in Paris in this upscale designer section up on the second floor called Nouvelle Espace. And we set it all up on in the, in the evening and there was two guys opposite us, uh, loads of other designers there, but none of them, I can't really remember who they were. But I remember these other two because it got to about 11 o'clock at night, the day before the show, and both me and my assistant, um, a, a kid I knew, uh, old family friends, son, we were kind of laying it and trying to perfect it. We, we we didn't have any mannequins, so we just put a nail in the wall, hung things on a coat hanger, and we, we did, you know, a shirt with a scarf and a jacket and pinned the trousers underneath and put shoes underneath to make it outfits, like, you know, 10 outfits along there. And, uh, and I saw these guys doing it over the road, and I was, we, we were kind of laughing because they, they turned the lights off and the security came around, so you've got to leave, and and um, you and all, you know, we were kind of like, so we, we both left and we walked down the road and out of the building with these two guys. And these two guys were Dean and Dan Cato from D Squared. And they were launching the following morning. And I remember turning up the next day. We had no idea what was going to happen. And um, these guys, D Squared and, and me, All Saints, it was like a there were people fighting to go on the stand. People like cry, climbing over each other to give me their business card. I, um, one of them was this Louisa Villaroma that I bought this red Gaultier jacket from, um, you know, demanding that they have exclusivity for Florence and 
I was like, what? They've not even really seen the collection. They've just seen these outfits because you couldn't get on the stand. There was all the best stores in the world queuing up to 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 buy the first collection. Uh, so, you know, that's what I'm saying as well. It's not like that anymore. I don't know what. <laughs> well, you, you say that, well, times were different, but I feel like you're one thing that I would like to find out from you is what do you think contributed to this success like what do you think that you've done differently so the first collection uh it was like a honeymoon period i left reese in october 1994 and then i showed the collection in january 1995 so the first collection was autumn winter 95 and um, so i had a you know quite a nice period to uh i used to go to uh portobello road on a friday to the vintage market and find really beautiful vintage pieces like Pico and a really beautiful Mac and and the perfect hoodie and, and things like that and and then use them as inspiration to create my own collection. And Prada had launched about, the, I think, the year before and they'd done... I mean, Prada used to be the most boring, classic menswear that you've ever seen. I used to see it when I was buying and designing for Reese. It was boring, but they'd come out with this... They, they had a new designer that came along and, they, and they'd done... Everything in nylon. Um, so they'd done like, you know, bomber jackets and Macs and rucksacks and everything. And, and, it, and it it just went ballistic it, all over the world. Prada became this, like the hottest brand in the world. Um, so I got hold of some really great nylon and I made a whole collection in, you know, I had like Macs in it and uh, cagoules and bomber jackets and I uh, did combat tracks. So I got military like combat pants and 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 a military flat jacket and I and I made it all in nylon, and but I also offered it in like a moleskin, like a that had a that had been printed over with a darker color and then I washed it so the lighter color came through on it. So it was kind of unique. So and and I also remember at that time thinking, you know, somebody doesn't like nylon, then they can buy it in a moleskin or whatever. But it was kind of it kind of very funny because most people say to me like, you know, that. You know, all saints, or they, and they look at me the way I dress, or whatever. They go, God, yeah, but look at you, 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 you know, you, you look like another world. You, you dress totally different than everyone else. And to me, it was kind of quite classic what I was doing. Um, but it, it wasn't, you know, as I was saying to you before we started this um, podcast. When you were at university, there's all these other kids that you know, fashion college. I don't know why the tutors used to encourage people to do. Um, really outrageous clothes that nobody's going to wear. Um, and I, I mean, I, I, that it's quite funny because when I was at uni as well, uh, they used to ask you to come in and bring a load of designs and then the tutors would go, oh no, what you should do is add another sleeve and all that. And you'd be like, who's going to wear a t-shirt with three sleeves? <laughs> or whatever. Oh, it'd be great, uh, you know, having a t-shirt with a sleeve. You know, I'd be like, fuck off, I'm not doing that. I, this is what I'm doing. I used to argue with them and they didn't really like it. Um, but then I, I'd never ever wanted to do something really wild. So to me, I was doing quite classic stuff. But of course, it, that was in my mind. But I, I'm, I'm like you know, living in another world, like David Bowie or or Adam Ant or you know, The Cure or whatever. I'm kind of that was I was fixated on really cool bands. I wanted to be in a band. That's why I kind of got into uh, you know, I wanted to be David Bowie, and um, and I ended up getting into that world through dressing bands and and creating looking at bands like that for inspiration the funny thing was over the years i ended up dressing all the bands you know all of those bands who did you dress i mean every virtually i saw i dressed the who for the um the super bowl uh for the closing of the olympics the closing ceremony and depeche mode uh kasabian uh kings of leon um i mean Beyonce, uh, Kelly Rowland, I mean, every, uh, those, like, nearly everyone, you know, Libertines for their comeback tour and, and loads of, you know, just what happened was we ended up with, um, ended up just being sort of like the go-to person for bands, like a new band came along and they would meet The Who or whatever. That was kind of funny, The Who came about because I dressed Kasabian for the front cover of NME magazine. They just happened to want some white suits. And I'd done some white suits out of this sort of Teflon coated fabric that you could pour red wine on it and, and it would just fall off the thing. 
but nobody really bought them. But I had the samples, and the stylist rang me and said, "Oh, I've got Kasabian for the front cover of the NME. They want to do Beggar's Banquet. I'm looking for white suits." I'm like, "Oh, I've got some." So they came and they picked them up and they brought it and they and they wore it and it was on the front cover. And then they were doing the Teenage Cancer Trust um, for uh, at the Royal Albert Hall, and uh, Roger Daltrey from the, who is the patron was the patron of it, and uh, he just happened to ask Kasabian, like, you look amazing, where did you get your clothes? And they told him about me. And I, well, I got a phone call. I didn't know anything about this. I get a phone call one day because I, I like, well, how are you? I went, uh, hello? And he goes, yeah, yeah. He goes, um, yeah, I'm, I'm all right. He, uh, Listen, I, I've been told that you're the, the world's, like, coolest fucking designer and I've got something huge coming up and I can't tell you what it is. And I'm sitting there thinking, this is Roger Daltrey. And I could tell by the voice, but I don't know why. I just said... He didn't tell me who it was. He just said, oh, I've got something huge coming up. Can't tell you what it is. Sworn to secrecy. NDNAs, all that sort of stuff. I went, what is it? He goes, it's a Super Bowl. And I was like, kind of like, first I laugh it because he's like, sworn to secrecy. And then he tells me immediately what it is. Yeah. And then I go and meet him. And uh, and I met him at the Wallace Collection in um, London. And um, he turned up and uh, walked in. And I had all these clothes laid out there and I was wearing this one jacket that was like black blazer that had little zip teeth around the edge and had quite thick grey stripes on it about 10 centimetres apart they're about a centimetre wide the stripe and it was lined with a union jack and he just came over and he just started pointing at me going come on come on like that and I went why he goes take the jacket off so I, I had to take my jacket off and he put it on and he's exactly the same size as me and then he took, put it off and then he started doing this thing where he's like you know I'm like, what are you doing? He goes, what do you think I'm doing? I said, I've no idea. And he goes, I'm swinging the mic. Like that. And then I realised that that's what he does. He does that's his, He throws the mic in the air and he catches it and then sees that. And then he wore that for the Super Bowl. I was speaking to this friend of mine yesterday about how to build his brand. And he asked me, how did I make All Saints a huge success? And, 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 and then I kind of compared it to when I went to see... Echo and the Bunny Men uh, supporting the Rolling Stones in Anfield last year, uh, and and I love Echo and the Bunny Men. I used to love them as a kid, and he, um, Ian McCulloch came to our. I, I did a men's catwalk show for London Men's Fashion Week back in probably nineteen ninety eight or something, and he, Ian McCulloch, turned up, and, and a very scouse. He was quiet. He was very nice to me, but. I remember asking someone else, why, why, why? And then when I went to see them play at Anfield, and they were so dour and boring. And then the Stones came on and they're just so, no wonder, I was like, no wonder they're the, listed as the greatest rock and roll band in the world. They were so energetic and, and exciting. And, and whereas, you know, just swinging away like that. And I realized, I was reading about Echo and the Bunny Man and Ian McCulloch and realized that you too copied everything that they, they copied the look and the sound and everything off of Echo and the Bunnymen. How did they become like the biggest band in the world, you two? And it's because they got up every morning and went to work. They they toured nonstop. They 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 took every opportunity that, that life threw at them and, and embraced it and went out and did it. Whereas Ian McCulloch was too busy whinging about how he should be bigger than the Beatles and and you know, this was before the, the Liam Gallagher dates where they, you know, being an angry young man or whatever, sold papers and, and people would write about it. They they people they kind of dismissed him because all he ever did was whinge about why he's not the most famous band in the world. But, you know, same with fashion, with All Saints. We, I took every opportunity there was. If there was a show to do, if someone called me up and said they wanted to, I used to get people go, why are you dressing that band? They're just some little indie band that never. Why are you wasting your time? Like my ex-wife would well, say things like that, and I'd be like, well, "You don't know that you know one of these bands that, that I've wasted my time on was the Kings of Leon, and they ended up being like the greatest, the next greatest band in the world." Or and another one was Libertines, and they ended up being the great. You know, so it's kind of like um, yeah, in my mind, the you know, in order to do something successful or to make something successful you just put as much effort into it as possible and, and it doesn't really matter don't worry all, all the time about the money and about how 
whether it's going to make you any money or whatever. You never know what, but just be really proactive and and take every opportunity and, and do it to the best of your ability. And and if you get, um, I mean, we used to do quite a lot. Quite a lot of times, you'd get offered to do a show in Switzerland, and they would pay for you to go there, or Hong Kong, or uh, Germany, or whatever. You know, the, the the British Fashion Council, whatever, or or the the government had some sort of thing back in those days, and they would pay for you to fly to Hong Kong and put on a show. And we seemed, well, I remember at the time, business partner saying to me, you know, we haven't got any customers in Hong Kong. We haven't got any customers in Switzerland. I'm like, yeah, this is how you get them. And and we did the show and, and, and put a lot of effort into it, made it really fabulous. And then the next thing you're in the best store in Switzerland or the best store in Hong Kong because you made the effort. So, um, yeah, that's my, my advice would be just to take every opportunity that, comes your way and and really embrace it and go all out and try and do something much better and exciting than anyone else's day. You must have so many amazing memories of All Saints. Like what's what's the number one favorite memory for you? Um Ooh, there, there's there's so many to be honest. Um I think the one I told you about when we launched it and all the best retailers in the world were fighting over it, um, at, you know, to get to to, to stock it. Um, that was interesting. And uh, opening the first store was interesting. That uh, came about because, um, yeah, the, 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 the woman that used to have Hyper Hyper in the 80s uh, was closed that down, but was opening a new sort of like more upmarket thing called Hype DF, which was hype designer fashion on Kensington High Street. And it was a bit like Hype Hype, but a bit more upmarket, a bit like a department store. And and I negotiated with her for the cheapest space, the, the largest, but cheapest space, which was in the basement, the far back corner on the left. And I had a, you know, big long run of a wall with a, with a, where there was a walkway. So I wasn't paying for the walkway. I just had to pay for the wall and the back wall. But it made it look like we had a huge apartment sort of thing and it, it and it worked we well i mean we opened and immediately we were doing like ten thousand pound a week or whatever and, and no one else was doing anything like that so they loved it and um i was in there one day and and a guy came down and he didn't look like your normal sort of fashion person but he seemed you know really getting into it really loving it and started chatting about you know he loves this brand and he thinks it's absolutely amazing. And can I tell him all about it? And I'm like, well, actually, I'm the founder. I'm the designer. I'm the main guy to, you know. And I just thought he was a customer or whatever, or or maybe his son was, he was, in, you know, but that couldn't work out because he wasn't very fashionable. But he was, uh, you know, a nice guy. So got chatting. And as it turns out, he was saying basically that he was about to buy uh, Carnaby Street. Um, him and his business and uh would i be interested in opening a an all saints shop on carnaby street uh he would give me six months rent free and he would pay money towards the shop fit and uh he absolutely loved what we were doing he's never seen anything like it and uh i was like oh that's a great idea to really believe him i thought it sounds too good to be true uh so it turns out this guy's Simon Quayle. He's the CEO of Shaftesbury. Uh, they bought Carnaby Street, and subsequently they bought half the West End, including like Chinatown, um, Soho, Beat Street, um, Seven Dials, Covent Garden, all that sort of stuff. But I, I didn't realise at the time. But he, they, they, they just started, and they bought Carnaby Street within the next six months of, of meeting me in this little shop in this sort of pop-up shop in IDF. And I signed up and um, opened my first standalone All Saints shop there, and it was a huge success. And um, so we, we, you know, carried on after the six months, and uh, we ended up moving to a very prominent corner site um, just off Fubert's Place, off Carnaby Street. Um, it turns out it's their 25th anniversary uh, last year, and uh, it was very sweet. Simon Quayle, the, this guy, wrote about... Um, the most exciting time for him at Shaftesbury in their 25 year history was uh, at first, I think the article opened up and it mentions um, uh, 
Jimi Hendrix, how he used to, you know, be or play in a club just off the Carnaby Street estate. And the second most, yeah, that was very exciting to him that he was buying that building or whatever. And the second most was when he, when he met this guy, Stuart Trevor, who had a brand called All Saints, and I was their first ever customer. So I was the first ever retailer that had a shop in Carnaby that on the new, well, just off the new Carnaby Street estate. So that was kind of funny, um, like very sweet. That, um, but I didn't realise at the time. But yeah, we we were the first one. And off the back of me opening this All Saints, he went to other you know big brands at that time were like Diesel and um, Replay and you know big Italian brands and 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 told them about how successful this you know part that they they bought one little bit of it and then they bought another bit and another bit and then they used to use all saints as a selling point to um all these other brands around the world of course all saints was tiny little business by then and all i was doing was selling off all the stock that i'd got left with from people that didn't pay me and things like that but then we ended up uh you know off the back of that one we expanded that one and then we started making things in the uk specifically to put in that shop to feed it and then we opened a then then when they bought seven dials uh they offered me a unit there and uh and i took that and then so all of a sudden these technical saints had two shops and then i had a customer in brighton that was and he used to ring me up every monday and say i've completely sold out of virtually everything you've got i, I need a, and, and in the end i took over that shop in brighton so then i had Three All Saints shops, and uh, and then uh, I, I, so yeah, kind of like you know the the highlights that I think were opening retail stores um, because you when, when you're wholesaling to even department stores or whatever, then you come in and you produce a collection, and in your collection there's I don't know four leather jackets and uh, and a bomber jacket and a pea coat and a mac and a and a and a you know like a wool overcoat um, and there's some trousers, some jeans, T-shirts, knitwear. What would happen is you'd get department stores and they'd come in and they'd buy one leather jacket and one coat and one T-shirt, one jumper. Yeah, that'll do. And 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 it didn't really show what we were all about. So how do you have your own shop? You would have, you know, one of everything that you'd actually designed and you could label, you know, layer it all up together and put it on mannequins with, you know, all dressed up your stuff on its own. And so it was quite exciting. And then... I really kind of got into, as I was expanding and opening these stores, again, we never really had any money. I used to go in there and, and there'd be like a semi-derelict store. Sometimes it would be like walls would be crumbling or plaster would be gone. The coving, the, you know, the cornicing would be smashed. And somebody, you know, my my business part of the time or, or other people, you know, we're going to have to repair that. And I'm like, oh, it's great. I am quite like it as it is. They're like, you can't open a shop like semi-derelict. Like, I'm like, why? And they're like, really, you can't. No one has a shop like that. And I'm like, yeah, that's all the more reason. Let's take a derelict-looking shop that like, looks like someone, you know, like a, a, a bomb shelter from World War II or whatever. And uh, when you put the clothes in it, you put a really nice till and you put, like, you know, some nice posters on the wall or, you know. I just think, you know, how, how do you think, you know, bands like The Clash or... Um, you know, Ziggy Stardust and the Spiders from Mars, or or, or what? They they didn't they didn't have white box. I hate that shop where there's like a plasterboard. I actually banned the plasterboard for from our shop. So I I used to take these semi derelict units and get buy in you know vintage industrial lights and spotlight them onto the clothes because you know, maybe didn't have proper lighting or whatever. So we would have standalone lights and point you know, and it. It kind of funny. It turned out that that everybody loved that, and and they even brands like Hugo Boss and Ralph Lauren and all that they all copied our interiors. It was kind of funny because um, in the beginning we were told you can't do that, and then and and even people like Shaftesbury were like, "Really, you're going to do that? I think you need to spend a bit of money on that. We, we'll give you some money to put towards the." So I would go away and buy a really beautiful old. Victorian gym sort of like vaulting force and put that in and use that as the till area or whatever rather than having a and and in the beginning they were like I wanted some sort of fitted cupboards and I'm like I don't do that I'm not interested in that and then when the shop opened they would come in and go wow this looks amazing <laughs> and all that so that was kind of funny so yeah opening stores and having having your own stores um 
And then also, you know, people ask, used to ask me all the time, but to how did all saints go like, you know, like, and I said, well, I used to get these vintage leather jackets and I'd send them to the factory and I'd get them to make them. And, and now I'd, like, they'd come in and they'd be all stiff. So I thought, fuck it, I'll put them in the washing machine. I washed them and took them out, hung them up to dry and then put them on where they were dry. They were really, you know, a bit more crumbled. I thought they were a bit hard. So I got olive oil and a bit back of the machine with olive oil come out as all beautifully soft and they're quite like a hard one. So I'd do like a hard version and then I would do a soft version. And, and they'd go, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I understand that, yeah, leather jackets are... Right. I don't mean it like, I mean, how did you, I mean, loads of people had loads of really nice clothes. I mean, your leather jackets were extremely nice and well, but yes, I'll give you that. But that wasn't, and I'm like, all oh, right, sorry, I now I know what you mean. Um, so yeah, what we would do is say we would open a shop in Liverpool or, or Manchester or Nottingham and we would take this sort of derelict shop and we would, you know, build it and open it and put the clothes in. So I, I would, you know, find a really cool looking person from that city and, and, employ them and say, right, you're going to manage the shop. And, uh, you know, maybe they used to manage one of the other ones or that they were a friend of a friend that I knew from Nottingham or whatever, I don't know. Um, and then they would have friends of theirs and they would come down. I'd, we produced like a flyer and I'd say, right, listen, go down to the local university or, you know, college or whatever and hand out these flyers and, 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 and tell these kids to come to this launch party. Um, and there's going to be free beer and there'll be, you know, music playing and discounts and things like that. And I didn't realise at that time, this was, you're talking 20 years ago. Um, I didn't realise I was targeting the equivalent of Gen Z and millennials. Uh, I was doing it because I knew that students would turn up for a free beer. Uh, and of course they did turn up and, and it was mobbed. And, and of course anyone else that was working in any other retail store would come and go, wow, who's this new store that's got 300 people? trying to get in it and and then you know it kind of set that store on the on the you know put, put it on the map and um and then they would come back the next day but they, but these students as well they would buy things like t-shirts um at 30 40 quid or whatever and, and belts studded belts and different things like that and then of course three years time when they graduate they're earning 30 40 grand a year that the first place they would go is all saints and they would spend a thousand pound a month and uh and there was hundreds of them in you know Nottingham and Liverpool and Manchester and and and, and that's how the business went because uh, we would oh and then when we'd have the, you'd have the launch party but then every like not every single month but every couple of months we would do the last Thursday of the month we would rotate it around the country we would do a, a party like a launch party or a you get like a new leather jacket coming or whatever or a new range of jeans or something like that and you you would just throw a party and invite everybody there so we would hold events it was a bit and that was another good thing about having your own shops is that you you have like it's almost like you you know be when you're in a band and and you go out touring and all that it's like owning your own your own venue it's your stage you can have a yeah it's a stage and you can have a you can have a gig every night if you want i mean obviously the last thursday of the month is good because it's everybody gets paid and they want to spend money they want to go out and cheer themselves up or whatever and um yeah and, and, and that's kind of like how all saints went like that so do you think you were very astute and understanding of what's happening currently in terms of you know the like the cool kids like what are they doing what you know just being really sort of on keeping your finger on the pulse with what was going on at that yeah. time well yeah because well i'd have i would have you know younger kids that would be working for me so even you know well when I started all saints at 28 and uh, so I was maybe 30 to 35 years old but I would be employing you know younger kids of 18 20 and they would be you know um going out a lot and and some of them were in bands the, the some of the um kids that worked in all saints back in those days um formed bands like kids that were in the shop uh one, one of them was formed by it was quite kind of funny. I had my uh, son was born when I was about thirty five, and I needed a nanny. And I asked a girl that was working for me um, as a you know retail director um, or you know overseeing all the shops if uh, her, her brother had come over. He was just a young sixteen, seventeen year old kid uh, from Denmark, uh, and he was at uni or college in Denmark. And I asked her can you give him this poster that, you know, we're looking for a, a nanny 
uh, and we thought, you know, maybe a young girl will come over and want to learn English and can come and live with us. And we didn't really have any money at the time. So we thought, well, they come and live with us, learn English, look after the kid as a weekend work. But mm-hmm. uh, it's quite nice. We, we lived in a really cool loft in, in Shoreditch. And, and I asked her about a month later, like, you know, would, would, uh, did your brother put that post up? She went, I've been in Paris to buy a teacher. And I went, why? She goes, well, he didn't put the post up. I went, why? She goes, he wants to do it. I went, all right, okay, that's great. I thought, my money, that's good. So uh, he came and moved in with us. He ended up, he used to sit at home drumming on the table. And I'm like, what are you doing? And he's like, I'm a drummer. I'm like, are you? He says, yeah. And I went, why didn't you bring your drums over? So he brought the drums over. And with the other kids in the shop, he, he, they, they formed a band called The Rakes. And, and, and they ended up having like, you know, top 10 hit. Amazing. With a 22 grand job in the city. It's all right. And um, and it was kind of uh, very funny, but there was loads. So yeah, p- people, I would have lots of, I mean, uh, you know, back in those days, there weren't that many really cool brands out there. Um, so yeah, I, we would we would end up in every city that we went to. The staff would end up like, almost like rock stars in 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 Nottingham or whatever. We, if I ever went up there, they we, they would take me to the local like the the best, the coolest bar or you know, club or whatever, but they would be sending over bottles of champagne and they would like all saves were, were, you know, these kids would, I'm like, are they just doing that for me? And they're like, no, they do it every weekend. They want, they, they want us to be in their bar because that makes this bar seem cool. So yeah, we, we, we would end up having like, you know, lots of really cool young kids that came to work for us. And then I would, you know, of course, ask them what were they into and what did they like? And they used to laugh at me and say, why are you asking me? Like, you're the founder of All Saints. And I'm like, yeah, I, I didn't design every single thing of myself. You know, I ask young people what they're doing and what they like and, and then kind of like go away and put the collection together or, you know, that that's kind of how it works. You know, that's how, you know, no, there's no designer in the world that just sits in a room on their own drawing pictures and... Doesn't it happen clothes. in a it vacuum. No, it doesn't happen in a vacuum. Mm-hmm. It's, you absorb things from you know, a younger, because I'm selling to, you know, younger people as well. So I want to know what, and, and older people that are 35 to 50, they don't want to look like a, an older person who's 35 to 50. They want to look like a young, cool 20 year old who's out having fun and, you know, living an exciting life sort of thing. So even, so you're better to aim at that kind of um, demographic and, and, and then, you know, the, the older people will, will buy into that and all that. I mean, of course you have, you know, your basics, your staples and, and things like that. And that's what you end up making all the money from. But, um, but yeah, as far as like a, an image or um, having a, an idea about, you know, what people want, it, it, you take inspiration from um, the younger kids that you surround yourself with. Yeah. With it being such a huge success and, you know, doing so, so well, why did you decide to sell? People ask me this all the time. We, I didn't need to. Um, we were, we we'd gone from, you know, this small, independent, you know, designer label selling to other people to uh, having uh, 13, 14 of my own shops, including like the the the, the last shop I opened was uh, in Spitalfields, um, the big one on the corner there, opposite Spitalfields Market. They were doing. They were all doing. Really, well, incredibly, we were doing about 15, 13, 14, 15 million turnover. We were started out in the beginning. And you would, you know, design a jacket like this and you would order 50 of them or 100 of them. What was happening by that point is I was ordering. So you, you, you write down, you've got 15 shops. This is how I used to order for Reese when I worked out when I was a kid. Whatever. So you'd work out each these shops and then you'd put them into tiers. So there'd be out of those 15 stores, there would be five that are selling four times as much as the other stores so that they would be a tier one and then you'd have a tier two of another five then you'd have tier three of another so you'd write down you'd you'd end up ordering 500 of this jacket Mm -hmm. then it became a but that's just this jacket then then there would be this t-shirt then there would be this scarf then there would be a leather jacket then there would be and you'd have to order like you know 
200, 300, 400, 500 pieces. Then, you know, they would come in. Some things would sell out in a weekend. I mean, we, we used to have shop managers ring me up on a Saturday and say, I guess how much we did this week today. I'd be like, I've no idea. Go on, I have a guess. I'm like, well, I don't know. You did what? You, how much did you do last week? They went 25 grand. I went, well, which was, you know, a lot of money to, on a Saturday at a shop in Birmingham or whatever, you know. And, uh, and I'd go, I don't know, what, 27? No. 28? No. 30? No. 35? Keep going. Fuck it. Oh, how much did you do? Keep going. Oh, 40. Keep going. No way. There's no way you've taken over 40 grand today like that, mate. We've took fucking 52 grand like that. But like, Jesus Christ. Most people would be jumping up and down with joy. I was like, how the hell am I going to keep this up? You know, I'm ordering 500 of a jacket now and 1,000 of a jacket now. And, I, and I've got, you know, you're ordering it, month, you know, two months, three months in advance. So I've got, I'm juggling all these balls. And it's, it became quite stressful, became difficult to sleep at night, um, which I never, you know, I'm just a normal, you know, I come from a council estate in Dundee. I'm kind of like all of a sudden running a fucking business, 15 million dollar, got to order a thousand leather jackets of this. And, and then you, that's not enough. You got to order two thousand. You're like, Gee, what? they don't want them anymore. I mean, little did I know that that biker jacket that I designed 25 years ago, they're still selling a couple hundred, you know, 500 a week. Or How was in this house? <laughs> and it's, um, but it was stressful. Mm. And uh, so somebody came along and said to me that they would take all that stress off me. They would run the business. They would uh, put in people that would take all that. And I could just concentrate on design which is what I wanted to do. I, I just thought, wow, this is amazing. Uh, that'll be a, such a relief. I can sleep at night. And and they were like, you know, you can just, you know, go over to New York and find a shop over there and go to Miami and find a unit there. And and and, and, and so, but even before I got these this person involved, I started looking at that and thinking, wow, that would be great. If I, you know, and, and then I persuaded, I had, by that point, that the Chinese people had gone, I had... Uh, I, a guy from Birmingham that used to be the retail director for Reese when I was at Reese, he came on board and invested in the business. Um, we bought out the Chinese guys. Um, he had a, 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 we had a silent partner who put some money in. And so I persuaded um, them to sell to this other guy. He was the ex-husband of Karen Millen. He just sold that, that business for 65 million quid. I was like, it, it, the right thing to do for the business is bring someone like that in that knows how to iron out all the issues. And um, uh, supposedly it was going to be a dream team. Um, it turned out it was the right idea, but the wrong person. Um, he has just come out of jail for uh, contempt of court. Um, this guy uh, that bought me out. Uh, uh, two months after he bought these other two partners out, he showed his true colours. He, he was a horrendous, evil, lying, manipulative bastard that basically uh, put a gun to my head and, and made me an offer. Literally, uh, I couldn't refuse. Um, and he he put a 20 million pound loan on the table and asked me to sign it. Uh, and I, my bank manager that I've been working with over the years and have built all saints up to, you know, 15 million turnover, he was like, Stuart, I think you should get it. You should shut up. Then, you know, this is this guy's to the mic. And I'm like, he said, I think you should get it, but shut up. I'm just telling Stuart, I think you should get advice like that before he signs this like that. I'm like, I'm not signing this. And, and he's like, you know, we, if you don't sign this, you know, you'll just be some piss pot little designer forever. And, you know, if you want to, be with the big boys, you've got to sign this and get on with it. And I'm like, I don't trust you. You know, I I don't know, you know, so far in the six months that you've been involved, you're hiring people on 200 grand a year and 250 grand a year fucking buying fabrics or whatever. I don't need well, any of that. You know, this is how you build a business. We're going to do, you know, I didn't really, I didn't, I, and, and I didn't know where the money came from. He was involved with Iceland at the Icelandic bank. And it turns out that, that the whole thing was corrupt. I didn't understand what he was doing was uh, he'd bought part of the Icelandic bank, this Landbanski, and they were lending themselves money 
that they didn't have. And then basically they bankrupted Iceland. But I sold out before all that happened. So it was the right time to sell. And I think that another thing where, you know, people come to me for advice, um, you know, no one can believe, like, why on earth did you sell all Saints? It was the right time. I think, you know, with hindsight, I mean, at that time I was devastated. I didn't want to sell it. I was having the time of my life, but I was also nervous and scared and having sleepless nights and worried about cash flow. You know, we were doing all this turnover, but you still have to pay, you know, your bills on time and, you, you know, I mean, we would, we were doing about three, four million a year profits. Um, so it wasn't like as if we had financial problems, but it was stressful. So I brought this guy in. It turns out it was, he was the wrong person. Um, I couldn't work with someone like that. I didn't trust them. And he made me an offer and I took the offer and left. And with hindsight, they took that 20 million and spent it one year. Uh, then they borrowed 198 million. They'd never repaid it. They still owe that money. He, they, they basically went bust about um, 2012. Some, uh, a billionaire guy called Lyndon Lee, Lion Capital, they bought them out and all Saints now are about 198 million to this Lion Capital. And, and, and they use that as a, you know, they, they all Saints as a, as a business pays interest on that 198 million. They still haven't paid it off. So they're only just coming into uh, profit the first time since I sold it. Mm. Um, pandemic didn't help and all that. And they had to restructure the business, things like that. Can you imagine having to run a business of that size through that? And, and I remember thinking at the time, do I need all this stress in my life? I, I never, I just wanted to be a designer. I just wanted to design clothes. I didn't want to be worrying about um, where the money was coming from, who I had to pay on time, uh, how do I you know, made my life easier or whatever like that. So I, I made a decision and, and, you know, in business, I think that it's very important for people to uh, realize that, you know, at some time, at some point in, in, in your life, you know, I know, I never thought I'd ever sell all saints. I thought I would still be doing it now and my kids would now be running it or whatever or getting involved in it. But it, unfortunately it didn't happen. It, that, that opportunity was taken away from me, uh, but I got paid a lot of money and I'm glad I did because, um, I, I wouldn't have wanted to run that business like that through the pandemic or through all all the other. I mean, look at, I mean, I would never have borrowed that 198 million. Well, it wouldn't even have borrowed the 20 million, never mind the 198 million. So we would probably be doing really well and all that, but you never know. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, sometimes in life it's better to close the curtain and be like David Bowie. Um, you, decide that, you know, you, just, you no longer want to be Ziggy Stardust and, and you close the curve, then you go away and you recreate something new. So that's what I did. Looking back now, would you have done anything differently? Yeah, I wouldn't have answered the phone to that guy. Mm. Um, I, no, not really. I think I've had a really exciting life, a really lot of fun. Uh, not, not, not as much stress as, uh, you know, I, I always joke about um you know I'm working on a new collection and people ask me about you know slogans and all that and I I, I said uh, you know a oh, great slogan for me would be um less stress more sex and all that like you know isn't that like everybody's that's what they want in life isn't it like uh, simple things yeah simple things that's what make you makes you happy money it doesn't make me happy it was never about money um not interested in I mean it's easy for me to say well uh, people would say it's easy for you to say that but I do come from a council estate in Dundee and, and until I was 11, 12 years old, I never had a brand new piece of clothing. It was all vintage. It was all hand-me-downs. It was all, you know, but I used to pick and choose from charity shops and that's, that's how I became a designer because I, you know, had to make do with what we could afford, which was, you know, hand-me-downs and vintage uh, or second-hand clothes. And then, you know, tailor them to fit me or, you know, bring a pair of trousers like that to fit a little waist of, and, and so you would, you know, end up with really big baggy trousers at 14 or 12 or whatever. And, and they look good. So, yeah, I, I don't think I would change anything. I think I'm quite happy now and, um, yeah, I'm glad I don't have a huge amount of stress in my life. Mm -hmm. And, um, I, I, yeah, because all I really want to do is, you know, wake up in the morning and 
think, right, what can we do today that's fun? Because that's what it was all about as well. It was, you know, we had a lot of fun. And um, and when things, when the fun stops and it all becomes a bit, you know, more of a, a stressful, I, I maybe it's time to move on. Hmm. So talking about moving on, you're working on a new retail venture, Impact. Yeah. Can you talk about that? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, so um, I met um, a guy, a uh, really interesting guy, he's ex-NASA scientist uh, called Gordon Eichhorn. And he approached me about six months ago um, because he has a, an Impact Accelerator program. And he wanted to meet up and ask me for some advice. I had to Google what Impact Accelerator was. I didn't have a clue. Uh, and I kind of then looked at what he was doing. And basically, they um, mentor people that have like a start startup businesses. Um, and and at all of these businesses, they have about 40 or 50 of them that they they bring through an accelerator program. So they kind of like, in exchange for equity, they uh, they small share in their business. They help these young, or not necessarily young, but, you know, young businesses um, to, they look at, you know, give them advice on how to grow their business. And all of these business ha businesses have a positive social or environmental impact. So there's like a bakery that uh, employs victims of domestic abuse. There's a coffee roasters and grinders that um, employ ex-offenders, uh, you know, to train them to become baristas so that they don't go back to jail. There's a huge issue with, um, you know, some people get involved in crime that, you know, might come from a Kansas State in Dundee or Liverpool or whatever, and they grow up and they end up getting involved in gangs or whatever. And um, they end up in jail. And, and when they come out, you know, there are a lot of, companies won't employ them so uh you know i love this fact that this i think there should be more of that going on because you know they, it doesn't necessarily mean they're crooks it, it, you know they i want to help people in life you know because i um you know things have worked out well for me coming from that background but um you know there are other people out there that are really talented that have a lot to offer that that don't get these opportunities um and it could be you know someone that's married to someone that beats them up and they, they feel like, you know, God, I'm just going to have to carry on with them. It could be a man or a woman, but, you know, because I've got to raise my kids or I have to, you know, provide a home or whatever. And so, you know, kind of that all appealed to me, but there was also a skincare company that have people on the ground in Africa paying four times the going rate for sheer not butter. Um, and because, yeah, I didn't realise that, but, you know, skincare companies, uh, it's all these, you know, men and women that are, are buying 150 pound jars of cream that are made from products a lot of it comes from africa and they these women in africa you know walking 20 miles a day carrying bushels of chin ups and you know and and they get paid pennies it's it's almost like human trafficking mm -hmm. so i i i look at all that and i'm like that that this the, the I'd, I'd like to help these businesses as well then there's also the web young fashion companies that 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 take vintage Levi's and then hand sew things on them and 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 then they had a, they ended up doing a whole collection. I talked to them about what I thought they should do and you know mentoring them, helping them build their business. And um, there's there's a, a company that take uh, old fire hoses and make bags out of them and so recycling, upcycling, and uh, all, all these things. And and there's about there's a, there's a company in Scotland that have. They take a specific wool, very long staple yarn from a specific goat in the Outer Hebrides, and they have it um, turned into yarn and made into sweaters. And they're, you know, it's all sustainable and it's organic and it's made in the UK. And 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 they're wonderful these sweaters. And they, you know, um, so there's a whole array of businesses. And my idea was like. Let's get them all together and let's create a mini department store of wellness and good, you know, good living and, and health and wealth and happiness and uh, well, health and happiness and, uh, you know, and hopefully wealth will come from that. So I, um, we formed this new business is called Impact Square. Um, we're talking to landlords, um, 
around the country. There's a lot of empty stores. Um, the biggest issue we have at the moment is rates. Uh, that That's it. I know that um, journalists are talking to me and probably you about that uh, in the next couple of weeks. The government seem to have no idea that they're are retail stores out there that have preposterous rates imposed. I mean, I've been offered um, the Gap store in Piccadilly Circus underneath the the lights, um, an amazing deal from the landlord, and uh, but the rates are six hundred and fifty thousand pounds a year mm-hmm. for a shop that I mean, no one's gonna. I mean, the shop's been empty for. I think the Gap closed it two years ago. Not one person's interested in it. Now, who's going to open a shop there? Even if you get it, an amazing deal on the rent, you've still got to pay £650,000 in rates. What for? What do you get for that? Nothing. So the government aren't, and the government aren't getting it. So, you know, the, there's the, the bank, the Barclays Bank, around the corner from that, they've got some charity in there that's, I mean, the shop's empty. No one goes in it, and it's, they've got a little coffee shop, but it's just like nothing in it. So... The government aren't getting the rates. I'm speaking to them. They've offered me a 50% rates uh, relief. That's still £375,000. Where am I going to... I mean, I've no guarantee that this thing is going to work. So I'm not going to sign up or... You know, I, I, I think... I, and I'm working with a charity called Resurgo that, that takes um, kids that come out of school. The education system in, in the UK is is ridiculous. I mean, they... they Rishi Sunak's just announced that they're going to, you know, we, 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 we want to train everybody in maths. Everybody should be learning more. Math. What, a, what a nation of accountants and, and insolvency practitioners. I mean, that's how ridiculous it is that, you know, our, our nation is, no, our, our, we, our people are the most creative in the world. If you ask Americans, anyone in the world, you know, who are the most inventive people, it's, it's the Scots, Alexander Graham Bell, me, um, who else? Uh, Logie Baird, TV, phones, fashion. Um, but, uh, you know, and British designers, our educational system, 5% of that budget goes on the arts and, and the rest goes on maths and science or whatever. I mean, like, why? It's a joke. Um, you know, we should be training. You know, there are a lot of, you know, young dyslexic kids uh, out there, and not just in this country, all over the world, that, that I... I I've no idea whether I am, but I'm pretty sure I've got ADHD, whatever. But I became, you know, successful in life. I don't know how I managed it. It was through determination and perseverance and hard work. I was lucky. Um, there are millions of kids out there that are never going to get the opportunity that I had. When I went to university, I got paid a grant to go to uni. They now have to come up with nine thousand pound a year just to go to the uni, and then they've got to pay their rent and feed themselves. So you've either got to have wealthy parents or take out some stupid loan that you'll be paying off for the next 20 years, 30 years. So I'm working with this charity called Resurgo, and they take these kids that come out of school that think, what am I going to do? So we're talking to them about taking 30 kids uh, from their program and training them to have a life in retail, um, help me set up a website um, to sell the products from all these startups um, you know, a, an online retail store, um, social media. There's there's all different areas. I want to take these kids and people from a disadvantaged background or or that have disabilities that wouldn't that maybe think that they're you know never going to have a exciting life or career. And that's there's there's no reason why they, they these people have a lot to offer. So I, I and I'm talking to the government now and the, and the Westminster Council about how how do we get around this rates issue? You're not even getting the money. So I'm not asking you for money. I'm asking you to allow me to take 30 disadvantaged kids and uh, 30 brands that are, you know, developing, uh, that are trying to do good in the world and, and give us a platform. And, and and hopefully within two years, we will pay you rates and we will pay the rent and all that. Because I'm not, you, we could set this up as a charity and then you don't have to pay rates or whatever. But I, I don't want this to be a charity. I want this to be a business that, that, flourishes you know um so that that that's kind of where we're at at the moment so watch this space let's see um how we get on and um if there are any people that want to speak to us about investment or opportunities landlords that have units that they might want a really because what we're, we're 
with this impact square, we're going to have um, a bit like when I was opening All Saints stores, and we're going to have events in there, and we're going to talk to, invite corporations to come down, and we're going to, uh, one of the things I loved about it when I met Gordon and, and all these young startup businesses is every single one of them are really, really, really passionate about their business and about, uh, you know, sustainability and environmentally friendly and, and social impact uh, that their company is, is, is or can have. Um, so we want to invite corporations that will pay us to teach their employees about sustainability and about, um, uh, you know, social impact and things like this. So, uh, and we're going to have, you know, parties and, and events and we're talking to, um, there's a beer that, that's made from um, leftover bread. It's called Toast and, and they have a slogan and it says, you know, in order to, in order to create a better, uh, a better world or a better planet, all you need is is to have a better party, and that, which is <laughs> it's easy for them to say because they're making booze. Um, but you know, I, I do want this impact square. I, it's I want it to be fun. I want to have I want to have a better party, and and I want to help other people, and uh, you know, environmentally and socially, uh, and and I think that we will have an extremely positive um, outcome from this. These young kids that are coming out of school, some of them are suicidal. Um, we went to a, a Resurgo uh, end of year where they, they, I mean, they help about five, 600 kids a year get on to the ladder. Uh, these are kids that have come out of school. Some of them are, you know, contemplating suicide, things like this. So we, we went to one and Gordon was sat next to this guy, this very, very dour, bomb faced looking guy. And this young girl got up and said that basically... Before she met the people at Resurgo, uh, she had contemplated suicide. She'd attempted it. But since she'd met them, she's turned her life around. She's now got a job doing this. And the guy next to burst into tears. He's like, you know, Gordon's like, well, are you okay? And he went, that's my daughter. Like that. And he was just so emotional. Now I get a little bit emotional now thinking about it. Can you imagine that's your daughter? And and so, you know, let's, let's do something really positive and help people that are less fortunate than us and, and and change the world. I think that would be a really nice thing to do. It would indeed. And I really hope our listeners are, you know, paying attention and reach out to you to to see how they can sort of support you and your mission to to do this. And I just That'd be great. And I just want to say thank you so much for for coming onto the show and just been amazing to meet you and to hear of your stories and Well there's loads more where they go, brother. I am sure. I'm sure we can spend hours and hours kind of going into that. But uh, as we were saying Hopefully we um started writing a book about all the stories. A lot of the, a lot of this I mean, I think I've been put off for quite a long time. A lot of people have asked me, You should write a book about it and and, and I just think, Oh, I'm not I just think it sounds a bit egotistical to say, "Oh, I'm going to write a book about my history." I I think it's more the idea of writing a book. Yeah, there was a lot of really funny things that went on, but the world was a different place 25, 30 years ago when I started out in fashion. And and there's a how you built a brand back then and and how you do it now is different. And I think it's important to register, write down how someone who comes from a council estate in Dundee has founded a business that now has a global presence, 350 million pound turnover, employing thousands of people. How is that possible? Um, I mean, I I got it to a certain point and then someone else, as I said, borrowed all that money and made it look like that. And now it's, you know, incredibly successful and respected all over the world. And, and um, but um, I think it's important for the next generation to, to learn about how people do, that sort of thing, even like what happened after I left All Saints or uh, and and, and um, but not just that as well about you know how how remaining positive and and uh, never you know always looking at uh, a route to um, positivity rather than, you know when when things are all going wrong because it was never it was never a an easy ride it was like roller coaster of of problems and and it was fighting through problems to survive and take um, take it to the next level. And I think it's important that people realise that. A lot of people say to me, it's all right for you, you found it all saints. It's like as if I was, you know, woke up with like Donald Trump with 20 million quid in the bank and, and then, you know, 
it's, it, it was never like that. And it, it was never easy. It was a lot of hard work, but it was a lot of fun. And and that's so. Yeah, I am supposedly going to write this book, and it will be interesting. And um, there has been uh, has been interest from um, film and TV uh, about turning it into a either a series or a movie, whatever. So let's see. That would that be would be fun, wouldn't it? Yeah, that would be fun. <laughs> Who's going to play me? <laughs> <laughs> Stuart, such a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you. Thank you so much. Cheers. Thank you so much for joining me here on Anatomy of a Leader. What were your takeaways? And if you haven't already, I'd love for you to subscribe and follow this podcast. And I'll see you in the next episode.